Welcome to another broadcast of The Deborah Ruffini Show on the Artist First Radio Network. All past shows are archived. You can find them at artistfirst.com. And now, from England, here she is, your host, Deborah Ruffini. Greetings from England. This is Deborah Ruffini with another broadcast of The Deborah Ruffini Show. Today, it is my pleasure to be speaking with Bos Chavidjan of Grace, Godly Response to Abuse in the Christian Environment empowering Christian communities to recognise, prevent and respond to abuse. Boz is the grandson of the late, great Billy Graham. Thank you so much for being with us today, Boz. How are you doing? Deborah, I am doing wonderful. As I was telling you a minute ago, I think it's about 65 degrees here in Florida and there's not a cloud in the sky, which I'm sure is just like another day in England. Oh, well, uh, don't push it. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, we get some days like that. If we, if I, I know. The, the, I told you that the last time I was in London, there wasn't a, a, a no. It rained once for about ten minutes, and oh, uh, I right. told somebody. I said, "You guys just make you make this stuff up about the rain, so uh, <laughs> so fewer people come visit." And I understand that. <laughs> Darn, our overseas <laughs> friends have uh, sussed us out. That's not good. Uh, <laughs> oh, um, what an amazing uh, cause Grace is, and uh, something I feel personally very passionate about uh yeah can i ask your, your passion over this um issue where, where did it come from this yeah deborah i i um i think it came from my days as a as a prosecutor um All right. you know i didn't know a lot about the issue of sexual abuse um, okay. prior to becoming a lawyer and prior to becoming a prosecutor and um hmm. You know, when, you, when you're given those type of cases to investigate and prosecute, at least for me, they really, in many ways, grabbed my heart and in many, many ways changed my life. I realized how, how profoundly serious and, and horrific uh, these cases are, how mm-hmm. destructive the, uh, the crime of sexual abuse, whether it's a child or an adult, yeah. uh, is, and, and how, how those who offend are uh, more than often uh, reoffending so, oh. you know, it came from my came from my work as a prosecutor, and, and as I began to prosecute, I realized that that there were some prosecutors who um, were uncomfortable with these types of cases, and and because of that, they were not, in my opinion, were not prosecuting them with the seriousness as I thought they should be prosecuted. And so, we eventually started our uh, sexual crimes division at the uh, prosecutor's office, and I was the chief of that division. Wow, and. We, we were able to bring in prosecutors who were, who were almost exclusively committed and passionate about handling these cases. And um, so, oh, yeah, I, I did that for a number of years. And, um, you know, when a, when a nine-year-old child tells you about uh, what her father's best friend did to her Oof. as a child, mm. it, you cannot help but be incredibly moved, uh, not only uh, empathetic for that victim, but wanting to find justice for her. And yeah. So, I did that, and then I, I left there and went into private practice here in Florida, and and I, I really was trying to think through what do I, you know, how, what do I do with everything that I learned as a prosecutor uh, uh-huh. in this issue? And um, very long story, very short is is I ultimately ended up starting an organization called Grace, which stands for Godly Response to Abuse in the Christian Environment, mm. and your listeners can find it at netgrace.org. Or excuse me, net n e t g r a c e dot o r g. Right. Um, but we, yeah, and, and so I, I'll, I won't keep going. I'll let you ask the questions. But that's that's sort of the initial um, starting point for me in, in addressing this issue. Wow, that's wonderful. Yeah, we'll have the um, uh, the link on the the um, featured on the show as well. So that would okay. be that would be great. But it's uh, I like what what's put on the website. Um, Jesus clearly showed a heart for children and the vulnerable. As his church, we must do the same. Yeah, I mean, I if, like if, if you think about it, um, some of the most beautiful words Jesus had for anybody were for children. Yeah. And some of the most harsh words Jesus ever had mm. was for those who hurt children. Uh-huh, yes, and yeah. If, if we acknowledge, for Christians, Christians acknowledge and believe that Jesus is God. Mm. 
So if we think about it, the God of the universe had some of the most beautiful words to say about children and some of the most harsh words to say about those who hurt them. And I, I really think that our churches in many ways have, have missed that. Um, and, mm-hmm. and so, you know, as, as a result, what I, my experience has been in, is that in more churches than not, children are, are sort of pushed to the back. Uh, those mm-hmm. who offend them are um, protected and empowered, and that is the complete opposite of the the message and character of Jesus. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Isn't it awful? Yeah, and very that's... awful. And, and that's why people, so many abuse survivors, flee from the church, and I don't blame them, because no. they thought the church would be a place of safety. They thought the church would be their greatest advocate when they stepped forward to report being abused, and instead they... They found themselves fighting against the church and losing community and uh, having the church turn their back on them. And that's, I don't know what part of that is a reflection of the Jesus that I know. So we have a long way to go. Yeah. And it's sad, isn't it? No, you're absolutely right. It's it's sad how we never hear sermons about this. Uh, Well, I've never heard sermons. Very seldom. You know, in in this country, I don't know what it's like in the UK, but... um, in so much of evangelicalism, the only sermons that you might hear on any type of issue today it tends to be almost exclusively on LGBTQ matters or oh. on abortion. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. and not about this issue, uh, the abuse of children, the abuse of adults. And, mm. um, you know, and, and that frust- that's frustrating for me, because if you say you're pro-life, <clears throat> then, then show it. Yes. Um, don't just be pro-birth, but be pro-life. Be pro-life. And I found that so oftentimes, in the cases that I deal with, the very same people that were, were you know, so adamant that the child should be born and so opposed to abortion mm. are this, oftentimes the very same people who will not believe a child when they step forward inside the church and disclose being abused by a church member or a church leader. So that is a, to me, that's a significant inconsistency that I can't quite grasp, Yeah, uh, but it's, it's tragic. And I think sometimes um, scripture can sort of be like cherry-picked, can't it, as to the, the thing that we have a bias against uh, uh, is sort of worse than, so we're going to make a big thing out of this and, and not so much out of something else that, that may not relate to us, you know. Yeah, so. yeah, very, very much so. We, we pick, well, what we do is, we, we let our belief system and our ideology define how we, what scriptures we read and which ones we choose to interpret and how we interpret them. Yeah. And so we, use, we end up using scripture as a, uh, uh, you know, a hammer to nail down uh, our particular positions yeah. instead of being d- directly the opposite and let scripture... You know, I, asked some, I asked my class one time, I said, when's the last time scripture actually altered and changed a ideological view or even political position of yours mm. um and i you, you don't find that happening very often no i think that makes your point that's yeah that's that's true isn't it yeah mm-hmm. i think it's dangerous isn't it how um i was just giving this some thought you know, since the last time we spoke uh we can sort of be i know this has happened to me sort of being programmed from the pulpit to trust the leader's every word because he's sort of supposedly being appointed by God with no questions asked, um, where, you know, as a consequence, the followers then go around sort of telling people this is the only version of, of God and his word and, you know, the only true version. And and then when they, they screw up, they almost have the cheek to say, well, don't follow me, follow Christ. I thought, well, you're supposed to represent Christ. <laughs> you're supposed to represent Christ. Yeah. Yeah, we, we see that often. You know, church, there are many wonderful church leaders, but yes, there are also yes. men who are, um, uh, who are, in my opinion, very dangerous. Yeah. Um, I think we've created a culture in the modern Christian world, especially in the evangelical world. And I, and, and, and Deborah, I'm, I'm, I guess I used to consider myself an evangelical. I certainly don't consider myself that today. You don't? Um, no. Oh, no. Um, but, yeah. but within that world, and that's the world I grew up in, um, we we have placed so much emphasis and power and attention on church leaders and pastors. Yeah. Um, if you think about it, I, I said this to somebody the other day. 
I said, in, in a typical Protestant church service, what, mm. what is the culmination of the service? And if you think about it, the culmination of a typical Protestant church service is a sermon by the pastor. Yeah. So the focus is on that pastor, and usually it's the pastor who gets up and speaks uninterrupted for 30 to 40 minutes, if you're lucky. Um, mm. And, you know, people taking notes, listening to every word he, he and it's usually a he, has to say. Yes. Um, if you go into a, a other traditions, Orthodox, sometimes even an Anglican, Catholic, the culmination of the service is not a sermon by the pastor, but it's, it's what we call the Eucharist, which mm. is communion, which is the Eucharist is the focus ultimately is on Jesus. So I love yeah. that. That distinction is actually very, very important, because on, in, one, in one community, the culmination of every gathering is Jesus. Yeah. In the other community, the culmination of every gathering is a man, a leader. Oh. Um, and, and that's, to, now, that doesn't mean that the Orthodox and Catholic and Anglican traditions don't have their issues. We all know they do, but mm. they're oftentimes different. Um, and I can't think of the last time I heard of a uh, an Anglican uh, priest who was a superstar rock star in his church and his community. Um, yeah. But <laughs> yeah. you know, but but you see that in in the Protestant world, all you know, over and over and over again. And so these these men have tremendous amount of power. Yeah. And then when they exploit and abuse it, because most of them who uh, land in those positions uh, either were or end up being narcissists. Oh. And yeah. When they end up hurting um, people, uh, either they people justify it, or they fall back on "I'm a sinner like everybody else, and I expect you to forgive me." And and people are expected to forgive and move on. Uh, it's very it's very toxic uh, on many levels. It it is, isn't it? It's horrible. I mean, I, do you know I can, like, this really resonates with me because I can think of certain churches I've been in and, and thankfully not too long <laughs> but um but I look I, yeah we all do little fo Facebook searches don't we and some of these people are, these leaders are sort of treating themselves like celebrities and they're even oh. putting like pictures of themselves and quotes that they've said and then their name but the sad thing is you know they're doing it you know we can see a meme with sort of like a um something that I don't know not a great lover of John Lennon, but something that some pe people right. think people are wonderful, and then oh, so and so said this, uh, you know, Bob Dylan said this, or but they've actually done it themselves <laughs> with the picture of them. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're, 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 I, I saw somebody not long ago on on Twitter. Um, it was a pastor who retweeted. So, so somebody had quoted his tweet, so, right. and um, and then and somebody had quoted him and sent out a tweet quoting him, and the pastor mm. retweeted that. I'm thinking, oh. <laughs> wow, like, like, so you're you're basically, this is the, how narcissistic we've become. You, somebody else is, first of all, somebody else is, you know, is taking a quote of yours and putting it out there, which, okay, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you see it, and what do you do? You're promoting it yourself. So you, yeah, you're, it's, it's, the, it's the ultimate self-promotion. Yes. And, and the problem is that we, as, you know, in many Christian communities, we embrace that type of culture. Yeah, and and that's that's what that's what's really troublesome. It's um, do you know, it's you're of good stock, aren't you, boss? Because your your grand so your granddad was Billy Graham. Yeah, and he was a real good guy, wasn't he? He's you know, it's it's really lovely because my parents hold, hold him in high regard. They saw him in Manchester uh, when he came here, but. When you think, so I know, in a sense, it's wrong to compare. But when you think of, sorry, it makes my blood boil, boz, Benny Hinn and people like Joyce Meyer, and I think a lot of people feel the same way. That, but there was no, your granddad was so humble with everything, and you know there was no sort of dirt on him, and and that that's what it's all about, being a true, just living by the person you worship, person that created you, your divine creator, representing that love. You know, yeah, I, just... yeah. I mean, I mean, and the thing is this. I mean, I loved. We call it Daddy Bill. I love oh. Daddy Bill. Daddy Bill was one of the most humble people uh, that I knew, and one was one was one of the most genuine well. people that I knew. But he was not a perfect person, and I and I think that you know I got to know Daddy Bill obviously a little bit later in his life, um, as his you know as his 
grandchild. Yeah. And, you know, I think Daddy Bill changed as well. He, he grew it. You look at some of the younger years of his, of his life and his ministry, there was a, uh, I remember telling my wife one time, I said, I'm not sure if I would have gotten along with the younger Daddy Bill. Oh. Um, you know, very fire and brimstone. Uh, you could tell a little bit, you know, a little bit arrogant at times, appeared to be, mm. um, and because he was young. And then he mm. had these issues with, with, you know, Richard Nixon, which I think really humbled him, and he learned from it. Right. And so I think the, the, the key, one of the keys to his life was that he learned from his, his mistakes, he learned from his failures, and he was humbled by them. And by the time I came along to get to really know him as a young teenager, mm. um, I knew one of the most humble people that I'd ever met. Oh. And, and so that's, but, but it, I don't know if he had always been that way. I think that, that through life situations, he was very teachable and humble and learned from it. And I think sometimes, oftentimes, we have leaders and inside and outside of the church um, yeah. who, don't learn, who don't learn from those things. And instead, they become more defensive, and they become a less less humble and more arrogant. And um, and again, that's I, again. If you're a pastor, I'm not sure how you reconcile that with the very gospel that you preach. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and I think sort of experiences change our. It's not that we change scripture, but we change our sort of interpretation of scripture. Um, And, you know, I think about when I was a nipper of, I don't know, 17, 18 at my first job and and telling someone off for playing golf on a Sunday. And I didn't know why it was wrong, but apparently it was wrong to play golf on a Sunday. And and I think, oh, if only I could trace that man now and say what an idiot I was. But I think I think we do sort of again, it's what we're programmed from the pulpit to believe a lot of the time. Uh, without any questioning or you know it's it's um and uh, i've just recently been re- reading vicky beeching's book was vicky beeching big in america the the uh gospel singer i don't no not that i know of oh okay i think she was british but she sort of made it in america okay. she's she's um she's same sex attractive but she's yeah. You know, they they dropped her as soon as she'd written uh, crumbs. What well, some of her music? Um, Above all else, I think. Above all else, I think that's one of them. Um, but she, yeah, they they sort of um, used her worship songs, and as soon as she came out, but she'd had a real struggle with you know, kept kept her feelings into herself. It was such such a long time, and then um, she had like a breakdown and had all these. She's got these um, autoimmune diseases through the stress of being so frightened to come out and and um and face the consequences that she she had she had a horrific time so she's now but it's it's just things like that isn't it that there's no but even if something is against god i, I don't know what i think about the the, the gay issue because i you know it's um again how much have i been fed to believe it's wrong how much is my sure. heart how much is by scripture but i think even if something is wrong in the eyes of god it's sort of like a a lack of compassion for the struggle of something rather than the do 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 this you know this is wrong there's no sort of compassion well, yeah I, I i don't disagree I, I think we are so quick in the christian community to point out what is wrong yeah and why it's wrong and how do we stop people from doing what's wrong or condemning people for what's wrong or uh, when they do something that's wrong, we shut them out of, you know, or, or if, they, if they communicate uh, a belief that is not exactly what we believe, suddenly now they're, they're out of the Christian community and we shut the door. I mean, it's just, yeah. it, it's, it's horrible. And in the meantime, what's, what makes things even worse in those situations is the very people who are so condemning mm. um, oftentimes are the biggest hypocrites. Yeah, by the way. yeah, yeah. And, and, and I see that, you know, I see that in... In, uh, in the work I do on, on abuse. I mean, I, I spend most of, so, you know, I left Grace um, last year, and I went back to a law practice that focuses exclusively on representing abuse survivors in civil suits uh, against churches and other organizations who fail to protect them from abuse. Right. And, right. you know, what I see when I handle these cases is, is oftentimes these churches and these leaders, they'll say things very publicly about 
being against child abuse and child sexual abuse and how they have no tolerance for those who, who abuse children. And then privately, because I'm seeing this in the lawsuit, in depositions and in court hearings, mm. um, a very different attitude. A di- yeah. An attitude of self-protection, an attitude of justification or of excusing or of um, a- attempting to uh, destroy the credibility of the victim. And, and I'm scratching my head going, you know, you're so adamant publicly. Yeah. But, but, but the reality and truth is that that's, that's a lie. Because I'm seeing how you're approaching this issue uh, where, when nobody's watching and when the t- television cameras are not turned on. And to me, that's what's most important. That's what God sees. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Do you think there are cases of um, a Christian abuser trying to persuade their victim or the church that what has happened is really sort of just a delusion from Satan? Oh, yes, all of the time. Really? Yeah, oh. I have a case now I'm dealing with where um, um, the, uh, the, the father of the abuser, so yeah. the abuser was a, uh, a teenage person, right? Um, and abused a number of children in the church. The Ooh. father of the abuser, when confronted, um, basically the response has been, this is an attack of Satan, and mm. and then when and and then what we have is friends of that father who are reiterating that narrative. This is an attack of Satan. It's a, it's really against not only you know this particular person, but it's against the church. So if you think about it, now they've turned the narrative into the fact that when this child came forward and reported the abuse, yeah. that that is actually an attack of Satan against the uh, perpetrator, and they include the church. And what happens is when they include the church, suddenly now the church members become very defensive of the church. And so <laughs> if we're not paying attention, what we've just seen is the, the offender or the offender's family member has just shifted the narrative to put the offender and the church on one side of the equation as allies mm. and the victim all alone. Oh, and if nice. you're not paying attention, you won't even realize that that just happened, and pretty soon you find yourself... Because you're so you're in a culture that's so dualistic, which is us versus them, mm. and what they've just done is is convinced you that the effect, that the victim is them, and the them is attacking us, and mm. we have to come to the defense of us, including the offender, because the offender will say it's a lie and it's not true, and you know this is persecution, and uh, you throw that word out, and everybody's like, oh my goodness, you're right, and suddenly now the offender has the church congregation coming to his defense and and oh, and cheering him cheering him on and and he is seen as the ultimate victim and it's crazy but, and it's really destructive that's that is that like you say it's absolute narcissism isn't it it's it's yeah. horrid and and it's what's sad is how many people will buy into that narrative yeah again it's the whole <sighs> If God has appointed this man, then who are we to say whatever he does is wrong? Right. It's very fair. I do think... I I don't know. I do think there is something quite sort of dangerous about um, controlling manipulative people who... not, Not in every case, but I think there can be sort of some people who are by nature, manipulative and controlling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When they sort of give their lives, if they're those sort of characters, they give their lives to Christ and then it may not always manifest that they've had this sort of miraculous change of heart and transformation. Um, but more that they take that control with them to judge the salvation status of others and give these apparent messages they've received from God, you know, making their control more sort of righteously justified. Sure. Um, yeah. And, and we, we, we hand them that control. And, um, yeah. And, it's, and, it's, and as, a, as a result, I mean, listen, the, these people who get to these positions, um, more often than not, they don't change. No, and no. It's, it's a, and it's all about control. And, 
and control of beliefs, control of actions. Um, and so oftentimes, these communities, they these 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 congr- congregants, um, just allow it. And if they don't like it, if they say something at all, they're usually um, vilified. Or if they don't say anything, they just leave. They they go to a different church. Um, mm-hmm. And as a result, you have these 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 men in power, and they're just they're they're consolidating their power. We see a lot of that. We saw a lot of that years ago here in the U.S. with Mark Driscoll, right. uh, the pastor of, of Mars Hill over in, in Seattle, which was a large church. He was very well known, very controversial uh, person. But the amount of control he had over those in his church, not just other leaders in the church, but over really almost everybody in the church, um, oh, allowed him to uh, engage in you know, uh, spiritually and emotionally abusive behavior for years. And and I've talked to people who came out of that world who are still struggling with the trauma that was, that they experienced. Mm -hmm. Um, It doesn't even always have to be sexual abuse. It's, it's the spiritual and emotional abuse that, that these, these men in power uh, exact on so many of their congregants in order to hold on to power. I mean, it's completely, if you think about it, it's so opposite of the life of Jesus. I mean, the life of Jesus was all about a God who gave up power. Yes, and, yeah. And, not, and didn't control everybody. Um, and that's why, you know, I have said many times, just because you call yourself a pastor or call yourself a church doesn't make you one. No. You know, if, if, if I call myself a major league baseball player right now, that doesn't mean I'm a major league baseball player. Yeah. And if you knew anything about me, you'd go, he is certainly not a major league <laughs> baseball player. But just because I call myself that doesn't make me one. And I, well, how's that different with pastors in a church? Yeah. It is. It's very frightening, isn't it? It's it's very scary. But it's, it's strange, isn't it? Because the whole um, uh, repentance, uh, a renewal process is, is... It's all about saying we're sorry, isn't it? Saying... Um, repentance to Christ but why can't we use that on our fellow why why can't these people who are doing this who have gone through the salvation process why can't they then apply it to their fellow human and say I'm really humble themselves I'm really sorry that was awful of me I'm a oh they uh, listen sometimes they do that do they but, okay but but that doesn't mean it's genuine no sometimes it's done in order to consolidate or hold on to power and so if you if you've used your position as a pastor or a spiritual leader to abuse others, the, the way you demonstrate repentance and sorrow is to step down and to yes. realize, you know what, I don't, I don't have the personality that can handle this type of authority and power, and, yeah. and so the best way that I can serve others is by stepping aside. But how many pastors do we read about who voluntarily step down for those reasons? Yeah. They either voluntarily step down because they're they are retiring, or they're moving on to a bigger church. Yeah. The others, the only time they step down is when they're forced to step down. How about how about the yeah. pastor who says, you know what, this is not healthy for me, and because it's not healthy for me, it's not healthy for you. Yeah. I've realized that, and I'm stepping down. I've hurt too many people. Mm. Um, and and then stay away from that type of ministry. Maybe stay away from ministry altogether. Yes. Go into something else. But it's amazing how many pastors will will step down from ministry from for something and pretty soon you see them back in ministry. It's almost like they can't function outside of of ministry. And I just think that's a joke. No, go get a job like the rest of us. Yeah. Because ministry wasn't for you because you used it to hurt people. Whether it's sexual abuse, emotional abuse, spiritual abuse, doesn't matter. Um, yeah. you you've given up your your ability to to have this type of position and acknowledge that and move on to something else doesn't mean that you can't serve God at any capacity no of course God God works through all all of us and we're all messy but it mm-hmm. does say okay it's not it's not your gift set to be that I mean just like if you know go back to my silly example of baseball I could go out and try to play baseball and I would do a terrible job. I'd probably hurt people with the bat. <laughs> and and I would realize, you know, as much as I love baseball, this is not this is not the gifts that God has given me. Yeah. So I need to go pursue something else. 
Now, that doesn't mean I may have nothing to do with baseball. Maybe I'll end up writing about baseball. Maybe I'll end up, you know, um, you know, announcing games for baseball. But I, I can't play. Yeah. And I think that's the same type of thing we see over and over again in, in the church and with church leaders. It is, isn't it? But it makes you wonder if a lot of the time it's more about just needing to be in this position of leadership and power and, and needing to tell people what to do. Yeah, it, 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 it is. It, it's a... And that's precisely the reason why they should get out of it. <laughs> yes, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, if, if you need that recognition, if you need that power, I mean, again, again I go back to the example I, I mentioned earlier. I mean, I can't think of another job where once a week you get up in front of a group of 20 people or 5,000 people, mm. speak uninterrupted for 30 to 40 minutes where people don't question you, they take notes, yeah. and then... You do that the next week, and the next week, and the next week. Yeah. I mean, I don't care who you are. That is an unhealthy dynamic. Yeah. And yeah. and it's and it creates, in my opinion, it can create monsters. Yes, yes. Or attract monsters who are already monsters. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think it's, the program I saw, I'm just trying to think what it was. The, the program where I first saw you, Boz, was... Um, where you featured, and you, uh, I was very moved and impressed by your words, where you said the higher up in leadership, in, in church leadership you are, the less likely you are to encounter Jesus. I thought that was that that did something in me, that sort of, yeah, I thought this guy's yeah, right. It's, well, it's, a, it's a, um, a friend of mine, Victor V, told me that years ago. Right. And, um, it's, and I found it to be true over and over again, especially as I handle these legal cases now. Yeah, you know, yeah. I'm dealing with leadership, and I remember I remember more than one time I can tell you this where uh, we've had a meeting with the church leaders and their lawyers with my victim, my client, and my client is asked to share about what happened, and it's a profoundly difficult thing to do, obviously, to share about your own abuse, especially to a group of relatively str- relative strangers, mm. and and every time this has happened, uh, after my client has finished sharing. Um, I don't hear a word from the church leaders. They just sit there. Oh, okay. And and instead of and and the lawyer does all the speaking. Instead of the church leader looking at my client and saying, "Listen, I I don't know about the legal stuff. I'm not here as a lawyer, but I just want to tell you that I am so sorry that this happened to you, and I grieve over that. Mm. Something like that. Yeah. But nothing. And I'm thinking to myself, um, wow. You know, this is the moment in time where you have the opportunity to express grief and empathy yeah. with a hurting soul. I mean, a soul and who's been hurt in your in your community mm. by oftentimes one of your employees or or uh, volunteers. And instead of instead of empathizing and loving them and expressing grief, there's silence. Yeah, and um. That's I see that, and so when I think about yeah, the higher you go up in church leadership, the the more less likely you are to encounter Jesus. I know for a fact that if Jesus was sitting in that room, he wouldn't re- look at my client and remain silent. Yes, he would probably yeah. he would probably either hug my client if they were open to being hugged, or would express words of deep, deep sorrow. Yeah, but silence. Yes. That's not a reflection of Jesus. It's not. So yeah, you go higher up and higher up in, in leadership, less likely you are to encounter the Jesus that we all know and love. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And then you, I like it when you said, um, if you love Jesus, start acting like him. That was quite powerful. If you love Jesus, start acting like him. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I say that to myself too. I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think um, we all do to a degree. I, I, uh, kind of... I, I think it's a challenge that all of us have to have to to live by if we if we profess to be Christians. Yeah. Um, is and I have to you know in the work I do I have to be careful that I don't become overly cynical or um, you know, self righteous about self righteous people. <laughs> um, and mm-hmm. and not to become the very dualistic not to have a very dualistic perspective that I that I condemn in in the church. The us versus them. Yeah. Very easy yeah. doing this job. Um where you begin to look at it the same way, the us versus them. The them is the church and the church leaders, and and the us are the people who have been hurt, and all of them 
are evil and wrong, and all of us are good and right. That's that's and that's looking through the same lens as they are, but in a different way, and and mm. that's not healthy or right either. No, but I think when you, when you take um, bullying and narcissism and all these other sociopathy to to a degree um, out of it, we're left with the average person, d- decent person, who acknowledges that when when we've screwed up, we usually know, oh crumbs, I've got a conscience about this, and I need to say sorry, and that's that's your average decent person. But I think it's when there's um, this self righteousness that comes in that that it's a different thing, isn't it? We can all, I think we could make judgments in in a um, way opinions rather than uh, you know, and we we can have opinions as to so- whether something's right or wrong. Um, without well, and, be... and keep in mind that we, we, at least in this country, I don't know what it's like in, in the UK, but, but you know, we're, we're living in an era that was dominated by a man named Donald Trump. <laughs> person, <laughs> I've heard of him. A person who would uh, never apologize, Yeah. who cannot acknowledge doing wrong, who vilifies and dehumanizes anybody that he disagrees with, yeah. and... What's most concerning about it is so much of the evangelical world has have embraced him, and when you embrace him, you have to embrace all that. And suddenly, we see the much of the evangelical world acting in the same way. Yeah, um, and that is again that's that's the great, in my opinion, the great condemnation of the church, the American church. Um, and I, I think you know I, <laughs> I think God only has so much patience with that. Yes, um, especially yeah. when you're doing it in His name. And um, and so yeah, I, I think that's and so what I try to, you know, what I try to share with uh, survivors that I encounter who were abused in the church and who have you know who have no interest in God or Jesus, um, is to understand that you know for right now that's that's fine. Mm. I don't. I get it. I I understand why uh, anything with the church is traumatic. Yeah. And you know, my hope is that they will encounter, whether it's through me or other people, um, maybe a little bit more of an accurate reflection of who the real Jesus is, um, because they're not seeing or experiencing it in so many of their churches. No. Um, and again, there are, there are good places and good people out there. I don't, again, I don't, I, I don't want to overgeneralize it, saying all of the church is wrong or bad, and it's all filled with bad people or, or people who are like this. I think there are, there are decent decent Christians in so many of our churches today. Yes, but I yes. think more often than not, they are still, they've still been sucked in by this culture that we've been talking about, and sometimes they don't even realize it. And if they do realize it, only a small portion of them will walk away from it. Others will just either ignore it or say, or excuse it. And, um, and I, I don't think we have the luxury of doing that as Christians. No. No, we don't. We've got to stand by... Um what's right isn't it we can't just go along with anything that we don't yeah head right. in sand and you know just oh, well, if i put my head in the sand it'll just go away but all the time people are suffering people are... right right but i think yeah i mean like you say a, a consequence of that i mean I, one of my guests was um a lady maureen sullivan and she she had been one of these uh magdalene laundry girls so you know i think it mainly happened in, in ireland um then you're fam- familiar with the, the magdalene laundries run by nuns and okay. it would be sort of like for fallen women, usually young girls who um, got pregnant out of wedlock or, or even they didn't sit to sort of view them fit to raise their child even if they were married. It was for any reason, basically, they would have these girls. Yeah. Um, and Maureen, because it was because of the horror she experienced, of the, you know, the nuns would beat her and horrible things would go on. She can't even bring herself to look at a cross. Yeah. So she's now a pa- uh, what she not pa- what do you call it um, druid? I think she's a druid, which I don't know much about. But I sometimes think about that, and I think, well, you know, she's not in rebellion, but she's deeply hurt. And I like to think that that God is is so big and so mighty that He will look at her and say, "Oh, crumbs, Maureen, come, you know, come to me." Um, oh, you know. Oh, yeah. You know, I I I I share this story sometimes with with people that I think sort of paint that same picture, and that is, I remember a number of years ago I was speaking at a very small conference that was for um, uh, missionary children who had been sexually abused on the mission field. Oh, crikey. And, and, there, and that's a whole other topic, but, but 
you know, I had, got, I had gotten it's the privilege of getting to know some of these uh, missionary kids. They were now all adults. Mm. Um, earlier, a couple years earlier, when my, the organization, Grace, was doing an uh, investigation, had been asked to do an investigation on that particular mission organization. So I got to know these, a number of these people through interviews and things like that. Anyway, I was mm. at, this, at, the, um, at this conference, and a couple of them came up to me and said, um, hey, do you want to join us later tonight? We're going to be sitting outside under that gazebo at about 11 o'clock. I said, sure. Mm. And uh, they said, just be a few of us just hanging out. And they said, we would, um, you know, we'll probably be drinking and smoking. I hope that's okay. And I said, that's absolutely fine. Yeah. Um, so I, I went out there at 11 o'clock. And, you know, Deborah, I, I remember sitting there. I had a drink in my hand. I think I even had a cigarette in my mouth. Yeah. And yeah. and I remember, and it's hard to explain in words, but, but there was a very, very real presence of Jesus in that group of people wow. that night. Um, and I can't explain it. I, I told my wife after, I, I, I felt the, the presence of Jesus in that group uh. far stronger than I have in any church I've been to. Oh, and, yeah. And, you know, and, and some of these, a lot of these missionary kids, they, they weren't Christians. I mean, they had walked away from it, understandably, because of what had happened to them. Yeah. But Jesus was there. Yeah. Not a doubt in my mind. And it, I walked away from that experience going, that's what I love about about God, is he shows up in the most unexpected places, oftentimes in the presence of the most unexpected people. Yeah. And and I would say the same thing for, like, what you were just saying, is, is somebody who's been hurt or abused in a church who can't. I know people who can't even open their Bible because the abuser oh. would read Scripture after he had sexually abused them. Oh, my goodness. And now they, they're incapable of opening up the Bible, and they feel tremendous guilt over that. And I said, don't don't need to feel guilty about that. God gets it. Yeah. God is bigger, so much bigger than we can think. Yeah. The fact that you can't open the Bible because of what somebody did to you with that Bible, do you not think that God understands that? Yes, that's uh, right. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I think that that's so true, and, and I've just, I've, I've come to appreciate and learn that over and over again in my own, my own faith journey. Mm. Yeah, that's absolutely. Actually, I I can um, relate to what you just you you've just said. That I I have a family member who, um, uh, hadn't had a great experience in the church, and no. um, you know, lots of negativity, lots of judgment, and then uh, they became quite ill and had to receive um, radiotherapy at the local hospital, and uh, drove herself to. There's a little about 15 minutes from where I live, it's called Portsdown Hill, and it overlooks the town. And it's quite scenic, you know. It's a, and that was her church that she'd say she'd, she'd get a coffee from the, the, the burger van and looking down at the... And at that point, n- never knowing whether you're going to live or die, you know, the, the cancer, and looking over the viewpoint. And she felt God's presence there far greater than, than when she was in the church with, with people slapping her. Yeah. And uh, no, I, that's uh, and that's you know that's where the that's where my hope lies. I mean, I do this 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 work. I've done it for now for over twenty five years. Oh, and great! Some people ask me, how in the world do you you continue to do this, and how in the world do you continue to have a faith after dealing with this issue, which is primarily I'm dealing primarily, not always, uh, right. I- inside faith communities. Yeah, um, that's a good question, and, actually. Yeah, I'd ask yeah, you the same. <laughs> it's it's. it's it's those moments in time, like I just shared, that um, that are the reminder to me that that God is present and God is love, um, and that God, yeah. uh, Jesus. If you look at the life of Jesus, he was always moving towards the the individual, never the crowd. He was always moving towards the wounded, not the the strong. Yes. Um, and I think the church has, by and large, forgotten that. And yeah. we're all about power and influence, and, and we justify power and influence by saying we need power and influence to, to change the world for Jesus. And, and that's just, that's ridiculous. Um, that's, that's not how God works. And, no. and we've seen that throughout history and throughout Scripture. But, but yeah, I just, so that's, that's, that's where my hope lies. That's um, brilliant. And, and that's why I'm able to, to, it's difficult for me to go to church. Is it? Yeah, yeah. Um, much, oh, yeah. very difficult. Uh, but, you know, yeah. so many people gauge your your relationship with the God of the universe on whether or not you go to church. Yes, isn't it? And it's crazy. Crazy. And 
And so, um, yeah, so I struggle with that. But And I struggle with, okay. I struggle with God. He and I wrestle quite a bit. Yeah. And I always lose. But, <laughs> but, yeah, there's so many questions as I get older. I have more questions than I have answers. And yes. I think as I get older, I'm okay with that. I'm at peace with that. I don't have to have all the answers. Um, even though sometimes I wish, especially in the work that I do, I certainly mm-hmm. wish I had more answers for people. And, uh, and I don't. And that's very frustrating. And I, sometimes I cry out to God over that. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, maybe one day I'll have a chance to, to talk to Jesus more about that. Um, but yeah, but yeah but I, 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 it has changed my faith in many ways, but I, uh, Jesus continues to be my anchor uh, even, when I don't, even when I don't understand. That's brilliant, and I think, but I think that's normal. I think I think it's far more um, normal, applaudable, accepted to to have so many questions because anyone that claims, I mean, God is dealing with the the creator of the whole universe and what you know the thing that's beyond the furthest star. We're not going to gra- we're not going to grasp the the you know one iota of <laughs> the com- the whole complexity, are we? Um, it's uh I think anyone that claims to have all the answers or pretty much know that they're going to be in for a shock. Well, and, and, you know, so oftentimes it's all about, at least in the world I grew up in, there was so much emphasis on right belief. Yes. And, and so that's why we had Sunday school and 30-minute sermons and, or 40-minute sermons or longer and yeah. Wednesday night church service. And <laughs> it was so much emphasis on right belief, almost yeah. obsessively so. And I'm not saying that belief is not important, but... This notion that you have to have um, certitude, and I remember reading a book a few years ago by a, a seminary professor named Pete Enns, and it was the, it's entitled "The Sin of Cert- Certitude." Oh, right. And and it was so refreshing for me to read that because it was it was all about how how wrong it is for us to focus so much on certainty, yeah, right, and and that we believe correctly and less on trust. Oh, that's interesting. Um, Yes, and and but but so much of the of the of the Christian world is this: you got to have the right belief, and you got to know, and you can't have doubt. Yes. Um, yeah. And and I'm like, man, I can't have doubt. I doubt every day. Absolutely. Um, and I'm okay with it. Yeah, that's that's good. That's excellent. Yeah. And there's a lot to get. A- there's an awful lot to get right. I was thinking about sort of like I, I personally can't relate to atheism but i have to understand there are people who genuinely do not believe in god but there's a lot to get right isn't there boss because one you've got to believe then you've got to get his, god's name right then you've got to get the um doctrine correct then you've got to get the dom- denomination right there's a, <laughs> in the end there's going to be very very few people <laughs> that are that are gonna know the way for, oh, sh- for certain yeah i mean that's the thing is is I mean, there are volumes and volumes of books written on systematic theology, yeah. and and you know what? There may be a lot of a lot of truth in a lot of them, but it it's it's so much effort in trying to figure it all out. Yeah. And and I just the older I get, realize that we probably all got it wrong a bit. Mm. Um, and and I'm okay with that. It doesn't. My whole entire faith structure doesn't crumble with the knowledge of that. What I believe that truth. Yes. Um, and and I'm a, I don't need to read books and books and books on how to defend my faith. Um, I just I, I don't need to do that. And I find that people oftentimes who do read those books because I used to be one of them. Um, mm. uh, it's because they're struggling with their own doubts. Yes. This is one way they can try to stifle out those doubts. And it usually the, the stifling usually doesn't last too long. Those doubts resurface. Instead, embrace the doubt. <laughs> That's yeah. That's a good attitude, isn't it? It's yeah because we're never gonna this side of life. We're we're never gonna know. We're not gonna know a great deal, really. Um, right. Whether we will ever know anything further, even after we pass this life, you know, it's it's still up to. It's it's the whole thing about letting go and letting God, isn't it? And it's um, and I think we feel more relaxed if it if we stop trying, just trying so hard, trying so hard to get it can be exhausting. And and maybe maybe instead of trying so hard, like like you just said, um, mm. what if we just focused all that effort that we spend trying to get it all right, loving mm. those God has placed around us? Yes, that's beautiful. Yeah, and it's a you know it's it's definitely a challenge. It's not always easy. I 
I know it, but but you know, trying right. to think through how do I love those who even to me may be unlovely. How do I love? You know, I was talking to my wife the other day. I said, how? I mean, this sound. This is just an example. It's a silly example, but it's but it's true. Mm. You know, how do I when I come across somebody with a big Trump flag hanging out of their truck, Ooh. which we have quite a bit around here. Oh, do you? Sorry, or, that. Or flags that say, you know, F Biden. I won't say the whole word. Yeah. Um, you know, instead of immediately, I, I can certainly be offended by those things. I, I think that's really important. Um, mm. It's okay to be that. But instead of immediately demonizing that person, mm. um, how, through the help of Jesus, can I look at that person through a, a lens of love? Yes. And that yeah. is not easy. No, not no, for me. no. But, no, bad. but I think that's the challenge. Rather than just becoming the same way that I complain about them, and that is, you know, dehumanizing them and you know, vilifying them, and and going, wait a minute, I've come become the very thing that I don't want to become. And as as somebody who loves, professes to love Jesus, I, I need to be different. Yeah, that's a big. Oh, do you know, Boz? If we had more Christians like you, I think the the church would be more full. <laughs> I don't, I don't, my family would probably disagree with you. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I think that's it takes, nice we need attractive Christians. I think that's what it is. We need, you know, no one can, like you say, no one can ever be perfect, but we need attractive Christians in order to basically represent Christ. That's what it's about, isn't it? You know, we all fall short at the end, but it's kind of at least trying to represent Christ. And, you know, uh, it's, it's messy stuff. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, sort of circling back to where we started, and that is, you know, my, my commitment in life is to, in some way, shape, or form, and in all its messiness, reflect a bit of Jesus to people who have been sexually violated. Yeah. And especially those who've been sexually violated uh, within a faith community, and who, who's whose understanding of Jesus has been so distorted because of that. Yeah. And and so for me, one of the things I love with my job now is that I can actually be a legal advocate for them. Brilliant. And, and to go file lawsuits and go to court and advocate for them, not only as their lawyer, but my hope is through that, like I said, that they'll see a some reflection of Jesus, of, of, of the real Jesus. Yes. Um, and... And it's a great pro- pro- privilege, and it's not about going to church, it's not about them reading and memorizing scripture, it's not about them you know, having personal devotion time every day, or reading all these Christian books, or listening to Christian music. Yeah. No, it's, it's simply um, helping, showing in some way that, that they are valued and loved. Um, That's and, it, yeah. And, you know, let, let, God, let God work in their lives the way that God believes is best. Um, but I just want to be that reflection, and... Some days are easier than others, but mm. it's a great privilege to do that. And yeah. it's, a, it's a daunting responsibility, too. Yes, I bet. Oh, amen to that. Thank you so much, Boz. That's been, thank you so much for chatting with us today. It's been, it's been an absolute honor to have you on the show. And um, Oh, Deborah, that's sure. uh, very kind of you. I've, I've enjoyed it. It's a good, uh, it's great, it's good it? conversation. Yeah, it's and wonderful. I appreciate, the, I appreciate what you're doing and you giving a voice to so many of these important issues and... and um, I, oh. I hope people are not only listening, but but I'm I'm hoping that through what they're listening on your show, um, maybe it's it's tweaking or changing their perspective a little bit, and uh, and that's mm. that's a really healthy thing. I'm grateful oh, for that. Thank you. Oh, I hope that's what it's. Yeah, I mean, I'm hoping. Um, it's all about being passionate, isn't it, about this sort of thing and to get the message out there and to to help others and you know this this horrific thing and um, we so appreciate what you do in rescuing so many lives. You shouldn't need, you shouldn't need to be rescued. Really, that's the sad thing. These lives shouldn't need to be rescued, but you know it has to happen. But um, and um, to the audience, thank you for tuning in. And if any of you, um, if any of this has resonated with you, please uh, seek the available help that is out there. Uh, the link to Grace will be featured here. And um, until next time, lots of love and God bless. <laughs>